Are we ready? Yay! Yeah. That's good. Katie, in the beginning, God created everything. He created people in His image to be His friends. And it was good. But then the people God loved so much turned away from Him. Sin entered the world, and everyone and everything was broken. And for thousands of years, people kind of did their own thing. And it got pretty dark. But from the beginning, God had a plan to rescue His people and to rescue us. And He shared that plan with the prophet Isaiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon His shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Katie, I'm going to light the candle of hope. That is what hope looks like. It looks a little wonky. Are you going to burn the house down? I think that's enough hope for today. <laughs>
let's prepare our hearts to listen and learn by participating in a communal prayer written by Black author, pastor, and activist Andrew Wilkes. The prayer is entitled, One Small Step, a litany for not knowing where to start regarding issues of justice. And you can follow along with the words on your screen. We affirm that liberation is the divine intent for all human beings, everywhere, in every age, especially those who are oppressed, minoritized, and exploited. Christ, set us free to experience freedom, justice, and peace. We commit to upending injustice, working alongside those who are directly impacted. Generous God, supply us with courage to realize liberation by interrupting injustice. We seek justice with discernment, rejecting the false ideal of having to know everything before starting anything. All wise God, help us distinguish between essential facts and non-essential perspectives so we can take informed action for justice. One small step to undo oppression is greater than an ambitious undone deed. Give us the strength to begin the work and the stamina to complete it. Where do we begin to fight for liberation and justice? Everywhere, Everywhere. in our homes and hearts, in our schools and streets, our workplaces and public spaces, our churches and communities. For the weapons in warfare are not merely human. They have divine power to destroy strongholds. As disciples of Christ, we undertake the spirit-filled work of pulling down the strongholds of institutional sin, structural racism, gender-based violence, and economic injustice. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. In church and society, we pledge to dismantle hierarchies based on gender, disparities determined by race, and oppression in all its forms. With spirit-led determination and righteous resolve to be living liturgies, we affirm these words together. We will not rest until all are free, all are whole, and all are home.
follow you into the world. Well, this morning we wrap up a, a series that we've been doing in the book of Philemon. Um, as Paul is writing to Philemon about his slave Onesimus. And if you've joined us over the last number of weeks, we've looked at the power of culture, the power of culture that can blind a Christ follower to seeing what they need to see. And then last week, we looked at the power of the gospel and how when we understand the gospel in the central character, which is Christ, it really helps us reframe how we are to see people. And that key verse that we looked at last week was verse 16 in the book of Philemon. So as we launch in today, I would encourage you to take your Bible for wherever you are watching this or maybe perhaps listening to this. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Philemon, shortest book in the New Testament, but carries a huge punch. And as we begin, I want you to listen to uh, Pastor Godfrey. And uh, uh, this is about a 10-minute uh, interview, but what he has to say about uh, the, um, the importance of healing and the centrality of the gospel when it comes to this issue of racism or just oppression. And I would encourage you to have a pen in hand as you listen to him. He says a lot of key things in this video clip. So watch Pastor Godfrey as we get launched into our teaching today. I want to uh, do a little exercise with you. I didn't put this in the notes prior to our meeting. Yeah. So I want to give you a word, and then I want you just to mm -hmm. take 30 seconds and comment on that word. In light of oppression, so racism, so you're speaking as a black man, but of course this, this yeah. applies to indigenous, uh, racialized, wherever there is racism or, or other forms and expressions of oppression. So I want to give you a word and then you just take 30 seconds and make, make a comment, with whatever comes to your mind in light of this issue. That okay. sounds like a game, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's cool. <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> Okay, so uh, here's the first word, power. Control. Hmm. Okay. Racism. Superiority. Here's a controversial one. Black Lives Matter. Is it Anthony or synonym or something similar? <laughs> Ah, you can interpret it however you want. <laughs> we can, and we can skip it if you want. Okay, Black Lives Matter. Every life is important. Okay. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Reconciliation. Hmm. Privilege. Systemic. Hmm. Okay. And I'll give you one more here. Healing. 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 Hmm. I'm trying to get the right word that speaks about uh, truth. Yeah, okay. And so on that note, that's a great answer. Um, if you were to, as you speak to our audience today, what are, what are two or three truths? that you think are really, really important on this issue of, of racism, of healing. So you've, you've already talked about, uh, like you've talked about nature, the dealing with the nature of, 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 of our humanity, whether you're black or white or indigenous, right? It's, um, and the gospel goes to the heart. You've, uh, so you've kind of elaborated on that. You've, you've talked about how, we're unique, uh, but we're equal, right? So you've made a lot, some good points here. But what would what would be a couple other truths if you were to say, "Here's what's important for healing on this issue." Here are two other truths. 
First, I think um, we should not sidestep the issue. We should confront it. Mm -hmm. Confronting simply means that we, like what you're doing now, I appreciate and applaud you for that because confronting simply means sometimes you need to just ask questions and don't always appear as if you know how the other party feels yeah. about the same thing that you, uh, you, you may have a different experience from that person. So just ask, yeah. how do you see this subject? So confronting the issue is, is very, very critical. Mm -hmm. And being humble enough to admit when you are wrong mm -hmm. and when you are being perceived or acted or received wrongly. Mm -hmm. So if the community around you feel that your relationship with them has been received wrongly, once they open up and say, this is how you've been treating us, be humble enough to say, oh, I didn't know that that was how you felt and i didn't know that that was how i came on to you so yeah. being willing enough to, to know that uh, people can be perceive things differently yeah. but for me what has been the major crux of my help and and also helped me while i was ministering in the u.s is the ability to understand that we all meet at the cross of christ yeah. ephesians 2 speaks about that he had made one man of all nations that both Jews and those who are far off and those who are near are brought nigh by the cross of Christ. Yeah. So at the cross of Christ, every human, every human being met there. Yeah. Every person met there in Christ. Yeah. And so if that is the case, then our theology should be different. Yeah. Our relationship should be different. Yeah. Our, our relationship should be different. Mm -hmm. because we all had the same heart problem that was resolved on the cross. Mm -hmm. And having to speak about theology, um, there are things that, 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 that also needs to be corrected, because if we all met at the cross, that simply means that my daughter can marry somebody else from another tribe or another race, mm -hmm. because if they, are both, if they are both Christians, because they all met at the cross. Mm -hmm. So... If we made at a cross, my race is not inferior to another race. Right. So I cannot discourage her from getting married to someone from another race if we all met at the cross. We are brothers and sisters. Right. If we all met at the cross, that simply means that I shouldn't see myself superior. I should see myself as equal with my brother. So I should be able to speak up if my brother goes through injustice. Mm -hmm. I should be his voice. I should be the voice of the voiceless. I should be the help of the helpless. I should be the defender of the defenseless. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible speaks about widows and orphans, it didn't specific, specifically define the tribe. So any widow I stand to defend, any orphan I stand to defend, anyone who is receiving injustice, I stand as God's representative who has met Christ on the cross to defend them. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I think that... Um, 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 our emphasis should not just be based on a partial doctrine of morality. Because while in the U.S., we, they, they, they keep emphasizing a few aspects of our Christian values, which is um, the sanctity of human life in the womb, right. yeah. and, and, and the rights of the family, and things yeah. like that. <clears throat> but the throne of God, Psalm 89 verse 14 says that, it's established on righteousness and justice. Mm. And the sanctity of life is not just in the womb, it's also on earth for those who are around, who are different from us. Mm. So God's throne is established based on justice from the womb to the tomb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That means the justice of God is for every life. We may, dif we may disagree on methodology, on how they are expressed, but we should stand for the value of every human life, yeah. whether they're in the womb or whether they're a different race. Yeah. The sanctity of life is important. So that aspect becomes easier when we realize that we met at the cross yeah. and we found, find our bearing, our theology, our relationship, our understanding of humanity mm -hmm. from the cross. But if Christ could die, for all the world, it means that Christ recognized the importance of and the value of every person in the world. 
yeah. as God created them in his image and likeness. And the last thing I'll say is that our diversity is our strength. Mm-hmm. Our diversity, being diverse from each other, being uniquely different from each other, is our strength. Yeah. When Jesus rose from the dead, he gave gifts to different people, apostles, yeah. prophets, teachers, and, and evangelists. Mm-hmm. He didn't just give it to one particular person. Yeah. He distributed his, his, his expressions in different people. And together we find the full expression of the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. The same with the gifts of the Spirit, mm-hmm. gifts of healing, the gifts of miracles, and gifts like that. Yeah. And it is the same Spirit expressed differently yeah. through different vessels. So if we see that it's the same Spirit mm-hmm. we met at the cross and we are all expressed differently, we can embrace each other and become better for it. Yeah. Because what I, my expression complements yours and your expression complements mine. Together we have the full expression of who Christ is and who the body of Christ should represent on the earth. Yeah. But these yeah. are just my own personal observations. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people at Bethel don't yell out amen real loud in services, but they <laughs> should be right now. <laughs> so... <laughs> So here's some of the things that I wrote down. I don't know if you wrote down some things, but I, I loved what he said when he said, uh, we should not sidestep this issue. Or, or sometimes we just need to ask questions, come as learners. Uh, or we all meet at the cross. He said that a few times. Or I love what he said, Justin, justice happens from the womb to the tomb. And I also love what he had to say about diversity and how actually we need each other. We should not be oppressing. We should be embracing one another. Uh, And I'd love for you as you're watching this, if you're watching this even in a group, to have that discussion in terms of what you think of when you hear those words, power, or racism, or Black Lives Matter, or forgiveness, or privilege, or healing. Well, today we come to the third of this three-week series, Topics, and this is what we want to look at today. The power of advocacy can change a life forever. And the question that we want to ask today is, how does Paul's advocacy mirror the gospel or the gospel of Jesus? So as we've said here that Paul is writing to Philemon, and it says in this letter that he's actually writing it with his own hand. And so as we come to this book, we know Paul's the author. It's one of the prison epistles. We might tend to think that, well, Paul's the hero. But as we noticed last week, that who gets a lot of mention in this book is actually Christ. And we looked at all the verses that referenced the name, the person of Christ. So the the real hero of this story, of this letter, is Christ. And thus I would put forward that Paul is just living out the gospel as he advocates for Onesimus, Philemon's slave. In other words, Paul is just following Jesus, which is what it means to be a disciple. His advocacy for Onesimus is, I think, just a simple profound, life-changing expression of his, Paul's, own discipleship. It's an outworking of God living in Paul by the Spirit, expressing the character and the person of Christ. So, So Jesus is the hero of whom Paul is following. So thus the question, how does Paul's advocacy for Onesimus mirror the gospel of Jesus? And I want to give you Uh, Four answers to that question today as we look at Philemon and as we look at this issue of advocacy as we all need to be involved in advocating for those that are oppressed. First answer to that question is Paul speaks the truth for the one who has no voice. Paul speaks the truth for one who has no voice. As Godfrey said, uh, advocates, we, we need to be a voice to the voiceless or a helper to the helpless, a defender to the defenseless. So how do we see this, first of all, in Christ's example? Well, as we come to this word advocate, uh, it's an interesting word. Of course, it's in the New Testament. It's a, it's a Greek word, and it can be found in different contexts. For example, in Acts 24, verse 1, we read this. Within five days of the chief priest Ananias arrived with a contingent of leaders along with Tertullus, a trial lawyer. There's the word, advocate, a trial lawyer. They presented the governor with their case against Paul. And so trial lawyer or advocate is a word that uh, means lawyer or it can refer to a person authorized to practice law or also one who has significant rhetorical abilities. And so you'll notice here in the context, though, 
that this character, Tertullus, was hired by the Jews to falsely advocate or to advocate in a negative way to make false accusation against the apostle Paul. So he's, he is advocating, but in a negative sense, he is spreading lies. Now, as we think of this in the negative sense, who else do you think of? I think of, for example, Satan, whose actual name means accuser. He's the father of lies. And we read this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. John writes and he says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of, Christ, of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers, have, referring to Satan, has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And so there is the accuser, Satan. So you have Tertullus, who is uh, advocating lies. You have Satan, the ultimate accuser of lies in contrast with another advocate, which is Jesus. And in 1 John 2, 1, uh, 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, Paul, uh, John writes, My little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. There's that word. Who is it? With the Father. He's advocating with the Father. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of of the whole world. And so here's this word. It's a, it's a different Greek word, but it's the idea of advocate, a person who acts as a spokesperson or a representative. And, and so just note the contrast, note the context. This advocate, Jesus Christ, is the what? He is the righteous one. He is the moral one. He is the one that is speaking truth. He is the virtuous one, as opposed to Tertullus, who is the accuser, who is the liar, who is deceiving, or the ultimate example, of course, Satan, who is the accuser. So Jesus, our advocate, is about truth and righteousness, not false accusation. So guess which example Paul follows? Paul is a follower. He is a disciple of Jesus. And so Paul uh, speaks the truth for one who has no voice. See, in Paul's context, as he's writing this letter, Philemon, uh, to Philemon, with his own hand, in that culture, as we've seen, swirling around in that context, in that culture, were all kinds of lies about the value of a human being. Uh, we've seen this especially in week number one. People are swimming in, a, in the strong cultural currents that have created unhealthy uh, power structures. In fact, the law of the land of the day says that Philemon can punish his slave Onesimus who has stolen something and fled. And when he's returned, the law says, Philemon, you can brand him, you can break his joints, you can impose some kind of punishment upon him. That was the context. Well, guess what Paul does? Paul speaks the truth in a context, in a culture of lies for the one who has no voice. Jesus is a righteous advocate. Now we have Paul acting righteously as an advocate, speaking forth the truth, not the lies of the culture. So what is the truth that Paul is standing up for? What specifically here? Well, let me give you a bit of a clue. In Acts chapter 22, we read an interesting story where Paul has been imprisoned. He is being beaten. He's, he's being put on a stretch rack, ready to be whipped. And some of us will remember this story in Acts 22, 22, uh, or in that chapter, Paul raises his hand and just says, hey, whoa, 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 guys, just let you know I'm a Roman citizen. He, he tells them of his identity. And the idea here, and as you read that story, basically is this, if you understand my identity, you will treat me very, very differently. In fact, I love it in Acts 22, the centurion went up to the Ro Roman tribune, who was the high-ranking military official, who had stretched out Paul uh, for the whips, and the centurion says to the tribune, what are you about to do? What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. Identity. Well, that's what Paul does for Onesimus, who has no voice. He tells Philemon of Onesimus' citizenship. As we looked at last week, verse 16, don't see him any longer. Don't you, Philemon, see Onesimus any longer as a bondservant, but see him as your brother. Not just your brother, but your, your dear brother. He is a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. This is your brother. 
So this issue of identity gets at the crux of the problem of oppression or slavery in the context of Philemon. I mean, people have value because of their identity. People have infinite worth because of who they are. I think oftentimes in advocacy, the truth we speak is the truth that, re that regardless of a person, whether they're in the womb or whether they are on their way to the tomb in some part of that journey, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their gender, people have infinite value. As Paul said, I'm a Roman citizen. Or as Paul is now saying of Onesimus, he's a, he's a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, identity. So this is a really, really important uh, point. When you speak the truth as an advocate regarding people's identity, you begin to actually erode the lies, the underpinnings of the systemic practices of racism or other forms of oppression that slavery is based on. One writer said this, that Christianity undermined the evils of slavery by changing the hearts of slaves and masters, by stressing the spiritual equality of the master and the slave. Uh, to illustrate, I remember when I was in high school and I learned how to play rugby, we were a terrible team, but I learned how to tackle. And the point was, you don't tackle high, you tackle around the waist and then you let your arms just drop down and you what? You, you remove the foundation, so to speak. You trip up the legs and the feet of the runner and that way you are able to tackle. How is, how is Paul wanting to tackle this issue of, in this particular case, oppression being expressed in the form of slavery? He's not tackling high, he's tackling in the middle. He's wrapping his arms around this reality and he's dropping himself down to the ankles of this institution of slavery and he's bringing it back to the truth about the identity of people or the infinite worth of people in this very particular case of Onesimus. Paul was seeking to upend injustice by declaring truth. Now someone might ask, well what if Onesimus upon his return had not come to Christ? Would he still have this kind of value? Well, we'll listen to this uh, article, just let me just read this uh, just briefly to you uh, on the racial issue. One writer says this, take a group of blacks, whites, Asians, Hispanics, and every other expression of racial or ethnic diversity. What can we say about everyone in the room? They're all made in the image of God. They all inherited original guilt and original corruption from Adam, and they all need the imputed righteousness of Christ. We need to be reminded that before there is the unique experience of being black or white in this country, it's an American writing, there is a shared human nature. There is not a white nature, a black nature, an Asian nature, or a Hispanic nature. There is a human nature. And when you meet someone of a different race, you should look at that man or that woman as someone more like you than different. Someone who deep down has the same sorts of fears, same sorts of sins, needs, and aspiration. We ought to think, and then here's the statement, this is my neighbor with an immortal soul. And though he may have experiences, for better or for worse, that I have not had, I am face to face with someone who has been made in the image uh, the same as myself. Paul's saying, if you understand people's identity, you will treat them very, very differently. Sp Paul speaks the truth. For the one here, Onesimus, who has no voice. I want you to watch this brief video of Pastor Milton. You met him last week. Uh, and note how simple yet profound this act of advocacy on Milton's part uh, makes such a huge difference. And this just illustrates the idea of, of being the voice. So just watch this for it's about a three minute clip. What, what's an, can you think of an act of kindness that has been done towards you and your wife? that the demonstration of advocacy of someone it's not you're not a project you're not my box i tick off right that this person genuinely uh was reaching across the room uh tearing down walls building bridges uh is is there a a, a story or a memory that comes to mind that was very redemptive healing uh a few years ago I had a situation, uh, this was before I came to Canada, but my wife was a part of, was on the um, 
receive the benefit from it as well. There was a situation that was going on, and it was something I didn't even know it was an issue. Yeah. Until I came to Canada, and then they're like, "Well, this is this might be an issue." So I go to Al- I'm down in Hoover, Alabama. I had to go to the city of Alabama to try to get this situation resolved, which, again, in the states, is not even an issue. Yep. So I go to the to the city to the head person and I explain to them exactly what my issue is. Now I'm in Alabama. <laughs> yep. I'm in Alabama, and this young lady, and she's an older, a Caucasian young lady, and I'm this this African American man who comes off the street. Yep. And I'm explaining to them what my situation is, and she tells me, Pastor Mark, she says, in the 36 years I've been here. They have never done what it is you asking them to do. Now I'm operating by my faith. I'm like, but I believe I'm gonna be the first. Yeah. And she says, what I will do, I will I will talk to the mayor, and I will see what it is we can do. Yeah. Pastor Mike, Mark, can I tell you? She got on the phone. I don't know who she called, but I got a call from the uh, the assistant mayor. I got a call from you know, the city uh, lawyer and all these other different people, everybody who is working on my behalf, who I never would have thought would have helped me at all. Yeah, yeah. And as a, and, and as a result of them helping me, it helped me, it helped my wife, and it helped even after we came over to Canada. And what it helped me to understand, which, you know, my parents, I, I had great parents, but even what it helped me to understand is, you cannot judge a book by its cover just because you had an experience with one person who was white who may have said a derogatory comment about you. And I mean, you know, people, I've been called the N word before and all that. But yeah. my response to that is I look around like, who are you talking to? And <laughs> like, I'm talking to you and I'm still looking around. They're like, why are you looking around? I said, because when I look in the dictionary, under that word, I don't see anybody who looks like me smiling. Right. And, and so I don't associate myself with that. Mm. Yeah. So that that changed, uh, and that hasn't been that many years ago, and that really impacted me because people who I would have least expected to help me, helped me. Yeah. Well, that reminds- I love what the clerk says. What I will do is I will talk to the mayor. <laughs> she got on the phone. A voice to the voiceless. The power of advocacy can change a life forever. How does Paul's advocacy mirror the gospel, the gospel of Christ? Well, Paul speaks the truth for, the, for one who has no voice. But secondly, kind of building on the first here, is that Paul comes alongside in relationship. See, advocacy involves speaking the truth, but it also involves coming alongside in relationship. Now, not always, because that clerk who helped out Milton didn't have a relationship, an ongoing relationship, getting to know Milton. But at times, advocacy does bring us into relationship. And of course, who set the example there? Jesus sets the example. Paul is watching Jesus, understands the life of Christ and advocacy. In fact, next week, start, uh, starting on December the 6th in our communion service, we will be celebrating the fact that God has drawn near. And to keep this really simple for this, just demonstrating how Jesus models this, in John 1.14, the word Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so it's interesting that this word advocacy not only means to speak the truth, and and defend the truth, as seen in the previous point, but it also has this idea of coming alongside in relationship. So the incarnation is about God, our advocate, coming alongside us. But notice what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. When Jesus is about to depart, he, he promises followers, and he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, another one who will speak the truth, another one who will come alongside and to be with you, forever. And so Jesus sets the example, Paul follows. We've already seen over the last several weeks how Paul refers to Onesimus in verse 10 as his child, and Paul is his spiritual father. And and in verse 12, uh, he says to Philemon, I am sending you my, my very, very heart. He's built a relationship with Onesimus. 
In fact, there's an interesting statement in Colossians, which is a letter that also was written from the prison and accompanied uh, the book of Philemon, a book that Philemon himself would have read or heard read. It's notice in Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 to 9, and notice the name Onesimus. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. So Paul is uh, going to be sending this letter uh, to Colossae, uh, where Philemon lives. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that we may encourage your hearts. And with him, there's his name, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Now, what do you notice? Onesimus is part of community. Onesimus is sitting at the table. Note the pronoun here, our. So this is not just Paul, but others who have invited Onesimus into or to the table, making room. Community has come alongside. Listen to Sushton. We heard Sushton, um, uh, I think it was last week, I'm getting lost in this series, but we've heard him already, uh, and he's done so much for us as a church as he's spoken into this issue. Listen to him and what he talk, how he talks about the issue of uh, making room for individuals. Listen to this. So, Sush, as we uh, end this interview, um, if, if I was to use my, my power, uh, if, and that's the right way to say it, I get, I, you can correct me, uh, to, to empower, to serve, to be an advocate for, whether it's on the issue of racism or other forms of oppression, what would, be, what would be two things I have to do? What would you, what would you say are two things that I must do to, to move down that road? Uh, well, first, first uh, the word power is, is central to uh, oppression. So that yes. it's exactly the wording you should use. It's the word uh, I should it, use. It, it is, it is absolutely the word that you should use. It's there in all oppressions, there's a power differential, yeah. uh, which makes it oppression, which is why things like reverse racism is, doesn't exist. And so, um, you know, when we get to that conversation, but anyways, augmenting, augmenting the voice of folks that have been traditionally mm-hmm. uh, marginalized. That's, that's, the most important thing I think mm-hmm. is, 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 is that folks have something to say, uh, and we haven't, uh, listened to these folks in the past, or they haven't been part of the decision-making process. These are, uh, that is making room for them to be part of not just in a consultative way, like, Oh, we'll take your, we'll take your, uh, feedback and, you know, we'll make the decisions. Yeah. Be, being part of the decisions and augmenting their voice in that way is is a good thing. Um, and so including them in those types of processes moving forward is is probably the most hmm. the most uh, most important most important uh, piece to yeah. all of it. You're giving uh, and then the other piece too, that that's right and 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 then using your power and influence for those, uh, in in the places that you have influence in terms of decision making, when where these folks, you know, folks like me or Black and Indigenous folks aren't there yet, being advocates in the halls of leadership in in influential pl- uh, places, mm. um, that uh, your voice uh, as a, as a, as an ally or. Uh, as I, I like the word advocate better. I like that you use the word advocate as opposed to ally. Mm-hmm. Um, advocating for advocating for folks um, in, in places where they're not there yet uh, yeah. is is a good thing too. Yeah. Okay. Augmenting the voice of people traditionally marginalized. That ties into the first point: being the voice for the voiceless. But I love what Sush then says: making room for them, including them, advocating for people when they are not there yet, expanding your circle. I love Colossians 4 where it says, Onesimus is our faithful and beloved 
brother. We've included him in our, in our circle. We, we, hear his, we hear his voice. Well, what's the advantage of a relationship in advocacy? I think one of the upsides of advocacy that involves relationship is that, is that we really begin to see people. I imagine that because Paul was with Onesimus, he and others in the community could tell you about Onesimus' hurts, his, his joys, his pains, his hopes, his expectations. Paul really saw Onesimus because he was with Onesimus. Now listen to Pastor Donna, who you met last week, as she talks about just the idea of being seen and, and being known. I remember um, once I had, um, and it may not be directly to it, but I think it's the spirit of um, her action. I was working in a very high profile um, position. Uh, I, I was a former member of the public service, the federal government, okay. um, the Department of Justice, and um, in a in a branch that was, you know, that developed policy, reviewed legis legislation and did programming. I was assigned to a program in, um, in Toronto and um, over the phone working with um, this particular person, um, you know, we never met face to face, but we had a, such a great telephone working relationship. And um, the time came when the program was finished and completed, we had to go for the, the big launch in, in, in Toronto. And when I got there, um, I went and I introduced myself mm -hmm. and the person took one look at me and sort of like was startled that, oh, like, you know, that look, I don't know if it was I was a woman or that he knew I was a woman, <laughs> but I think it was the color of my skin. Yeah. He didn't realize that um, I, you know, I know I don't have an accent. I, I was born yeah. in Jamaica, but I don't have an accent because I was raised here. Yeah. And um, so he was taken aback and literally in his shock or whatever, didn't even shake my hand. Yeah. And sort of like, you know, said a couple of words, then walked away. And I was a little perturbed by that. You know, so I mentioned it to um, my superiors, you know, would this affect the relationship going forward? And they said to me, and they uh, apparently they had advocated in a way that, um, you know, spoke to him mm -hmm. and to say, if this relationship is going to, going to um, be um, fulfilled any further, then he needs to check his attitude. Yeah. And um, I thought that was pretty big because there's certain politics around some of these programs and how we deal with, you know, the interested parties. And um, but you know what? He probably didn't even know I was hurt because even though in, in my spirit I was taken aback and I realized, oh boy, I've been singled out here in a certain way. Um, it was good to know that I had, you know, superiors that was going to be ready and willing to back me up, yeah. you know, and I've encountered that um, a few times where I've had, um, you know, people, um, my boss, you know, just um, speak words to me. Yeah. One day I was doing another project and um, I had the pen for my entire department preparing mm. a report to go to cabinet. And I remember um, I was so frustrated. I was tired. I felt I was out of my element. Um, this was something new and it was really stretching me. And I remember, um, you know, mm. her in a bad day, I was near tears and, uh, and very fatigued. And my boss saw my tears. And that was the key to me. She saw my tears. She felt for me. She saw me. And, uh, and isn't that what God calls us to? Yeah. You know, and I remember going home that night in tears and I was thinking, I'm quitting. I'm going to ask for a transfer to another area. But when I opened my emails the next morning, one of the first emails that was there was from her. She must have sent it from home the night to make sure I saw it in the morning. And the title is what got me in the subject line. You are wonderful. Please don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> How did she read my heart? Yeah. I love the line, my boss saw me. Or I was frustrated, tired, 
and thought I was out of my element, near tears and fatigued. But my boss saw my tears. She felt for me. She saw me. And then I love her question about her boss. How did she read my heart? Relationship allows us to read the heart, to see the heart. Earlier in our service today, we sang, led by uh, Broncos and Will, these words, I'll follow you into the homes of the broken. I'll follow you into the world. I'll meet the needs for the poor and the needy, God. I'll follow you into the world. This at times means building relationships with people. That's part of advocacy. It's interesting in Romans chapter 8, talking about the advocacy of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. This is just a beautiful paragraph. It's in the message. Um, And just listen to these words. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired and waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside us, helping us along. Notice the intimacy in the relationship. If we don't know how how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of the wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God, the advocacy of God the Holy Spirit. I mean, are you, are you wired? Am I wired into the heavy load someone experiencing oppression carries? Now, this is why Sush in the new year will be inviting indigenous, black, racialized people from Bethel for a meeting to, to be part of a conversation about how uh, we can better support those in our community who have experienced and are continue to experience social, mental, physical, spiritual trauma from racism, one form of oppression, understanding the heart, understanding the weight of what is carried. So how does Paul's advocacy mirror the gospel, the gospel of Christ? Well, Paul speaks the truth for the one who has no voice. He comes alongside in relationship. And then building on those ideas, he, Paul helps the helpless. We, we've seen that so far, but I wanted just to make this a point all on its own. He helps the helpless. So. Question, how did Jesus set the example? Well, what is our greatest example before a holy God? I think our greatest um, of example of helplessness before a holy God is that we owe a debt. Uh, one writer uh, illustrates it this way. He says, if you want to be absolutely distraught, take a cab to the corner of Avenue of the Americas and West 40th Street in New York and spend a few moments in the presence of the United States National Debt Clock The writer says this, the sign is 20 feet high, uh, 25 feet high, weighs 1,500 pounds and uses 306 bulbs to endlessly, mercilessly, mercilessly declare the U.S. debt and each family's share of that debt. He writes, as I stood before the clock, watching the numbers even ever scroll upward, I wondered, what if heaven had one of these? A marquee that measured not our fiscal debt, but our spiritual one. See, scripture often refers to sin in financial terminology. So if sin is debt, do you and I have a a trespass counter in heaven? And does it click with every infraction, you know, like, oh, we lie, click, or we're we're mean to someone, oh, click, or we demand our own way, click, 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 click. I mean, it kind of can be a depressing kind of scene here. The algebra of heaven, this writer says, reads something like this, heaven is a perfect place for perfect people, which leaves us in a perfect mess, totally helpless. But according to heaven's debt clock, we owe more than we could ever pay. But we have an advocate. Paul writes in Colossians, And you who were dead in your trespasses and sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, kneeling into the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them by the cross. It's a debt payment. He helps the helpless. Well, Paul follows the example. What is in Paul's hand that is not in Onesimus' hand? The ability to pay a debt, a different kind of debt. We, we noticed this last week in verse 18 and 19, and I'll read it again. If he has wronged you, if Onesimus has wronged you in any way, Philemon, at all, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. See, often the, the oppressed lack the resources that we have, and we have those resources to help. Paul had finance, at least more than Onesimus, it seems, so he leverages it for Onesimus. Paul had influence, more than Onesimus, 
with Philemon, and he uses that resource to help Onesimus. Paul had connections more than Onesimus, and he uses those connections. My guess is that every one of us listening here today has resources, has, had, has something in our hands that we can use to advocate for those who are oppressed. And note, Paul had another incredible resource that I think a lot of us might miss. If you look at verse 4 and verse 6, verse 4, I thank my God every time I, I remember you in my prayers. And then in Colossians, which this audience would have received that letter, Paul goes on and on about how much he's, he's praying. He is praying for this community. I mean, how often did pray, Paul pray a prayer like this? Lord, open the eyes of my brother Philemon that you will soften his heart, align his will, and give him the courage to do the right thing on this issue. Or how often did he pray for Onesimus? And as we saw in week number one, prayer is key. I mean, there is a spiritual backdrop to this darkness in our culture, oppression, and all of its expressions. So it requires a spirit-filled, prayerful work of pulling down strongholds of institutional sin, structural racism, gender-based violence, and economic injustice, and you could go on and on and on. What has God put in your hand to help? Prayer, time, money, relationships, connections, our areas of expertise. I mean, think of that clerk that, that helped Milton. She got on the phone to the mayor. She leveraged her connections to help this black man who was prejudiced against. The power of advocacy can change a life forever. Our question, remember, is how does Paul's advocacy mirror the gospel? Well, he speaks the truth for the one who has no voice. He comes alongside in relationship. He helps the helpless. And then finally and, and briefly, uh, Paul is on a God assignment. He's on an assignment here. So how does Jesus set the example of being on assignment? Well, John 17, remember what Jesus said in the garden just before he's to be crucified? I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Now, you know something very interesting about Jesus' ministry, and it's as obvious as the nose on my face, which is pretty obvious, and that's this, that Jesus did not meet, feed everybody. He didn't heal everybody. He didn't speak to everybody. He didn't go into everyone's home. He didn't raise everybody from the dead. Those he did interact with, it would seem from looking at the life of Christ, was a result of being in tune with the Father's will, which was demonstrated powerfully in the temple when Jesus was 12. His parents are looking for him and he's going, I'm about my father's business. He was about his father's business. He was in step with the Spirit of God. Well, Paul follows that example. Paul is on mission. Now, we have lots of questions, right, about how in the world did Paul meet Onesimus? The, the theory is, the story is that Onesimus, Onesimus commits some kind of crime, as we said in the first week. He flees to Rome, got lost in the huge slave population, but somehow encounters Paul, comes to faith in Christ. We're not even sure necessarily what Paul's role in that was. And then Paul develops this unique relationship with Onesimus. He calls him his child. He's a spiritual father. You can be guaranteed that Paul was not that close with everybody in the, in the kingdom of God, with every Christian. There was a special bond, a special unique calling, a special connection with Onesimus. My point is, is as Jesus was sent on mission, so too God sends us on mission to live out advocacy, the gospel. He helps us see people, but not everyone. He brings people across our path, but not everyone. He connects us with some, but not everyone. I know that there are some of you listening today. You have connected your heart with some people in various uh, expressions of oppression, and that's beautiful, and it's wonderful to see how God raises that person up in your sight line. You see them, and you move towards them. You're on mission. Well, listen to the following two testimonies by Abby and followed by Misan, two wonderful young women that come to our church. And what they have to say reinforces a lot of what we've already talked about today and in the last couple of weeks. But I want you to notice in particular how they are on mission to seeing who God might help them see on this issue of oppression. Just listen to this. Hi Bethel, my name is Abby and I'd like to share a couple thoughts on what I've been learning in the area of racism and injustice. I've been sitting for a while on the question of how am I reflecting God, not only in the values that I hold, but also in my response to these issues in our worlds. 
It's one thing to internally and silently hold a core value of equality for all humans, regardless of ethnicity. And it's another thing to actually take the active step to um, address injustice and to be part of the healing process for people who are marginalized or discriminated against. The church has a responsibility to walk as Jesus did when he was on earth. He came alongside people who were outcast in society, disadvantaged, and racialized, such as the Samaritans who were of mixed Jewish and Gentile blood. If we dare to call ourselves disciples of Christ, then we have to choose to reflect his kingdom values in the way that we live it out, in the way that we respond to issues of injustice. In the story of the miraculous healing of the woman with the bleeding issue in Luke 8, Jesus not only brought physical healing, but he restored her identity by calling her daughter. And as someone who is likely cast aside in society, Jesus called out and affirmed her value and identity out loud in front of the crowd. So a couple of things that I've been learning from a practical standpoint is the need to listen, empathize, and to affirm the value of those who are marginalized. Yes, it's true that all lives do matter and they are important in God's eyes. But for those who are suffering and those who are experiencing violence and discrimination or who have to live in fear because of their race, we need to hear these stories and affirm the reality of their suffering and to affirm their value as people who are made in God's image. The other practical thing that I've been learning is the importance of checking my own biases. So as a healthcare worker, I do catch myself with biases or stereotypes that cross my mind as people come through the door. So I need to be careful and it is a sanctifying process. And I believe that as we humbly pray that God will clothe us with the mind of Christ. Externally, scripture now tells us that we should speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. So going forward, what I've always done is when the opportunity um, arises, I will educate, I will inform, I will speak to people about these situations, I will spread awareness. Because surprising enough, in 2020, where we have advanced in science, in technology, you know, we're doing all these things, but there's so much, much more work to be done with empathy, to to love your neighbor as yourself, to look out and see, oh, this is, I should show love, I should show kindness, I should show, show compassion overall. It's such a challenge, which I don't understand why. And surprising enough, there is so much ignorance. I, I, I just don't know why, but I feel like rather than just um, see the world as what it is, I should be part of change. So I internalize that what the world says about me is not what God says about me. And I regard what God says about me as my identity as a Christ follower. And I speak up for others who cannot speak for themselves. I engage with others so that this narrative can change. Also, I encourage other people to learn from others and just take the time to listen, travel, explore what other people have to say. The message of the gospel is for all. The message of the gospel is for everyone, regardless of where they're from. And I, um, scripture talks about how at the end of the day, when we stand before God, we will be with God. And I think somewhere in Revelation about how no matter what tribe, what background, all nations will be before God to thank him and to worship him. And I think for me, that tells me that when we are before God, worshiping him in spirit and in truth, it shouldn't matter what our neighbor looks like because God loves us all. And I think that's all. <laughs> Thanks. Abby said, as people come through the door, I love that imagery. People are coming through the door of her workplace and there'll be opportunities to see people, to touch people, to minister to people on this issue of oppression. Or Misan simply referred to just love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, who has God put right in front of you there could be someone living right next to you, uh, working right beside you in a cubicle. Who, who is your neighbor? 
someone God wants you to see, someone sitting next to you on a bus or in a church or whatever the context might be. Think if, if Philemon asked the question, oh, where do I start with this issue of slavery? What can I do and how can I help? And, and, and such a huge ocean of need. And imagine Paul might just say, Philemon, just open your eyes. There's a guy standing right in front of you who needs your ministry. Sometimes that person is right in front of us. As the prayer we prayed at the beginning asked, where do we begin to fight for liberation and justice? Answer, everywhere. In our homes, in our hearts, in our schools and streets, our workplaces, our public spaces, our churches and our communities. How is God sensitizing you to those areas? What does, who does God want you to see? There's a real need to ask this question. Who, God, are you bringing across my path or do you want me to move towards who do you want me to see? So I think this is a really important question because we can become so discouraged by all the need. But God is not calling you and he's not calling Bethel to respond to everyone, every situation, but he is calling us to respond. And we need to reject the false idea that we have to know everything before we start anything. There is very possibly someone standing in front of you. Don't wait to know everything about the issue before you do anything. God, who are you leading me to? If you call Bethel your home, this, this series that we're wrapping up today is really an important, important series for us as a church. As we live out our vision of responding to the heart of God, which is advocacy, and then transforming the, the city and the nation and the world. And so as we wrap up, I want to just share with you some reflect questions on the points that we've shared. We've seen that how Paul um, mirrors and uh, the gospel of Christ and his advocacy, these points. Paul speaks up the truth for the one who has no voice. Uh, who, who do you need to speak up for these days? We saw how Paul came alongside in relationship. And he, and he saw, he knows the heart of Onesimus. Are, are you wired into the heavy load someone is carrying these days because of relationship? That's part of advocacy. Paul helps the helpless. What has God put in your hand to help? It might just be prayer. It, it could be your time, your money. It, it could be a relationship building. It could be your connections. It could be your area of expertise and how you can use that area to help the oppressed. And then finally, Paul is on God assignment here. Who is God bringing across your path? Or who does he want you to see? Your neighbor. Or to use the imagery of Abby, who is coming through the door that God wants you to note? I mean, imagine a church where we advocate. Imagine the hope we would bring, as we said at the beginning of this service in our Advent reading. Because as advocates, we are not the central message, but Christ is. The message of the cross must remain at the center of all we do as it is the only hope we ultimately have to offer. And this is how we can change a life forever in advocacy, by sharing with those about our true advocate. We advocate now and we want systems to improve so that there's an equality of people, that people are seen of, as equal value or importance, significance. But ultimately we want people to meet and encounter the ultimate advocate. And so as I pray, I want you to pray back part of the song that we sang in the beginning. If this is uh, your prayer, then I would just ask you to, wherever you are, close your eyes. If you're driving a car, perhaps you shouldn't do that. But if you're able to, just close your eyes and repeat this after me as we close. And this is part of the song that we sang in the beginning. But Lord, as we come before you today, wherever we are on this issue, it's our heart to follow you in discipleship. It's our heart to mirror Christ in this culture, to live out the gospel, to be uh, agents of the kingdom of God on earth. And so, Lord, now as we conclude this series, really conclude this series, but continue on a journey of learning about advocacy and addressing issues of oppression, Lord, we pray, many of us pray this prayer right now. And if this is your prayer, just, just follow me, just re repeat these words in your heart. I'll follow you into the homes of the broken. I'll follow you into the world. 
I'll meet the needs for the poor and the needy, God. I'll follow you into the world. Use my hands, use my feet to make your kingdom come to the corners of the earth until your work is done. We pray this in Jesus' name, our righteous advocate. Amen.